a very testable thing. So one thing people get hung up on is there's two stock positions we have. You know, most people get hung up because in most businesses, when you sell things that you don't own, it is called fraud. But in our business, selling things you don't own is called a short stock position. And what you're selling is borrowed securities. And since that is the case, it's very important that we are clear with what type of position we're trying to open. Are we trying to open a long stock position or for that matter, a long option position? Or are we trying to open a short stock or for that matter, short option position? And so, you know, on an order ticket, we're going to have four boxes we check. And if we're trying to establish a position, we're going to check opening. And if what we're trying to do is establish a long stock position, we're going to do an opening purchase. And that alone is a test question. They will say on the exam, which of the following types of orders would be used to establish or add to a stock position? I think it's kind of like if you come visit me in Vegas and you go into the casino and you want to establish your position within the casino, you're going to do what's called an opening purchase, right? You say you want to buy some chips, right? You're from the casino's perspective, that's going to be an opening sale. And so on the test, they can say, which of the following would be used to establish or add to a short position? And then you would say an opening sale. So, you know, you're going to go into the position and at some point you're going to exit or get out of the position. Sometimes we say we're going to offset that position. So if I'm your broker and you want to get rid of your stock, you're going to do a closing sale. And again, on the test, they'd say, which of the following would be used to eliminate or reduce a long position? In my casino analogy, right, when you're ready to go home, you go to the cage and you close out by selling your chips. And you're hoping that you have more uh, money than when you started, right? Yeah, again, very similar in making investments. I turn my money into the investment. That's called my cost basis. And at some point, I'm going to turn the investment back into money. And I'm hoping that I have more money, more purchasing power. But again, on the test, they'll say, which of the following orders would be used to eliminate or reduce in my casino analogy or even the stock? If I have 1,000 shares, I don't have to sell 1,000. I could sell 500, for example, and let the other 500 ride. So when the minute we hear is a test taker, eliminate or reduce, we know it's a closing transaction. And then we just have to decide whether it's a closing sale or a closing purchase, depending on what the case may be. Because as we said, we have two stock positions. So this is a very important answer set. I can't imagine any draw of the exam in which you are not going to get this uh, answer set. And so let's just go through this answer set. If on the test they say, which of the following is used to establish, let me get a color that shows up a little better. Used to establish or add to a long position, we'd say an opening purchase. You know, I thought about some point uh, writing an entire practice exam just has answer sets with no questions. <laughs> And I do think that's one of the challenges on your exam, by the way, because, you know, all of the uh, distractors, distractors are the technical name for wrong answers. And as you can see in this answer set, every wrong answer could have been right to some different question, depending on what you're being asked. But the key phraseology for the opening is when we see use to establish or add to. Now we know that's an opening transaction. So now what we have to decide, are we trying to establish a long position or a short position? And then we said, uh, you want to offset. You know, so what you're gonna do now is you wanna get out of this transaction. I say, hey, listen, I'd like to close the sale, do a closing sale. And the key phraseology we're looking for as a test taker is used to eliminate or reduce. Now what we mean by re reduce, is that again, you don't have to sell all of your shares, right? So use to eliminate or reduce. Now we know it's a closing transaction, either a closing sale or a closing purchase, depending on what the original uh, transaction was. By the way, this is the same phraseology we would be using for options. And sometimes I might say, or offset, they might use that phraseology, offset a long position. So these are how we establish these positions at a broker term and how we close out these positions. As we said, you're hoping that that closing sale would be for more money, right? And then we said a closing purchase 
would be used to eliminate or reduce or offset a short position. So that's how we actually initiate these positions in terms of uh, these types of orders. You know, the today or tonight, we're talking about types of orders. And these are the types of orders you have at uh, available to you, arrows in your quiver, right? Arrows in your quiver, so to speak. So uh, if the customer wants to buy at their price or better, they're gonna give us a limit order. The only order that has no contingency, no qualifier is a market order. I want immediate execution at the best available price. You know, I get, I get kind of aggravated and demented when I'm elsewhere and people don't understand the market order. You know, I, they start telling me all the ways I can get a better deal. I said, I'm really not interested. I just want it now. I want it and I want it now. If I'm more interested in execution than I am price, I'm going to be using a market order. You know, uh, for example, uh, Knopman liked, liked the way I started out one of their practice exams. Uh, they had given me permission to uh, put one of their practice exams up on the channel. And uh, unbeknownst to them, as soon as they gave me the permission, I went online and I bought their thing and I did the thing. And because I just knew the bureaucracy might be such that who knows, it might be two more months before they send me some content. And so uh, I started by saying I used a market order at Knopman. I just went online. I bought the Series 57 course. It was 350 bucks. I might find out later there's some coupon somewhere or, you know, my brother loves hunting coupons for things. You know, I, I'm not interested in doing that. Now, the customer is either going to be interested in execution or price, and depending on what's more important, will depend on the type of order. But the big takeaway for us as test takers is we only have one order that has no contingency, no qualifier. You know, um, long ago, you know, I was uh, going to an NBA championship game and the guy who I was talking to said, well, you can't go, it's sold out. I said, no, it's not sold out. It, at some price, there is a ticket and I'm not interested in the price. You know, whatever it costs me to get my butt in that stadium, I'm gonna pay it. You know, and then my buddy said, well, I'll go for $2,000 or less. And his name is Joe. I said, well, Joe, you may or may not be at the Bulls game with me this evening because you're saying that that price is more important to you than the consideration. Now, again, this is kind of like muni bonds. You know, people think there's a lot of muni bonds. There's not. There's just geos and revenues. And people think there's a lot of zillion types of orders. There's not. There's only two. The only two types of orders there are are market orders and limit orders. Now, granted, there are zillion contingencies or qualifiers you can add to an order. We're going to talk about all those contingencies or qualifiers that you can add to an order. But at the end of the day, it's either a market order or it's a limit order. And as we start that journey, the only order that has no contingency, no qualifier, is the market order. So buy a thousand shares of Apple at the market. I want immediate execution, best available price. Now, if you give me a limit order, you're saying you want to do business but you want to do business at your price or better. And nobody has to do business with you at your price or better. You know, it used to drive me nuts with customers calling and say, well, did, you know, did my order go off? And I said, well, nobody has to do business with you at your price or better. So as a buyer, there's an implied or better or less. Now, be careful, ladies, uh, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> we don't have to, as a customer, tell you it's a limit order. If I specify my price, it's your job to know that's a limit order. So if I say, Diego, buy me a thousand shares of Apple at 160, that is a limit order. It's not my job to know that's a limit order. That's your job as the broker. Now, again, you call me back, Diego calls me and says, hey, Dean, uh, your limit went off. You got the Apple at 159. I go, woohoo, that's even better, right? So as a buyer, my price or less. Now, as a seller, my price or more. Now, I used to use when my uh, brokers would say, Dean, are you buying office, the office lunch today? I said, yes, I'm buying the office lunch on a $500 limit order. If we cannot feed this office for $500 or less, I'm not good for it. Now here, the price is more important than the execution. Now, if I didn't give my brokers a limit, my God, they'd be willing fizz on under glass in for lunch, right? So customer wants their price or better during that day's trading. Now, I had a customer one time, he said, Dean, let's put in a buy 1,000 at uh, 18. I want to buy 1,018. My job to know that's a limit order. You know, and all orders are considered day orders unless we're told differently. And so, you know, I called him the next day. I said, hey, your order didn't go off. You didn't get your price or better. Would you like to re-enter it? 
He goes, yeah, let's go for it. Dean, let's reenter it. I called him Wednesday. <laughs> the fourth time I called him, he said, Dean, why do you keep calling me? I said, well, because, you know, it's a day order and I want to see if perhaps you want to reenter it. I said, tell you what, if you make it GTC, GTC good tell cancel, I'll stop bothering you. And he says, okay, let's buy 1,018 good tell cancel. Now, nowadays with technology, we remind customers that they have these limit orders on the books. But, you know, in the old days, we would cancel these orders in April, and October, when the specialist would clean up the order book, you know, because the specialist is the one who's holding uh, the limit orders. So buy limits, their price or less, and very testimonial where we place orders in relationship to the current market price. You know, for example, right now, I'll just put up a little thing here. Uh, today, Apple's trading at 160. So current market price of Apple is 160. And uh, let's put a little thing here. You know, you'd be very foolish. You'd be very foolish to tell me with Apple at 160 that you want to buy Apple at 162 or less. I'd say, well, listen, you must be new, you know, and I'd buy it at 160 and I'd fill you at 162 and it beats working for a living. It's very testable to know where we place orders in relationship to the current market price, where we place orders in relationship to the current market price and limit orders by limits are below the current market price. And that is very testable. No, now I have a nice, beautiful thing you've probably seen, and we'll go over it together. Uh, I know you're excited. And uh, we have a nice memory aid device to remind us about where we place orders in relationship to the current market price. You know, and that's going to be slobs over bliss. So it's a little ahead of where we're at right now. The buy limits go below the market price. And that's very testament to where we place orders in relationship to the current market price. Now, as I said, if you're foolish enough to not follow that convention, you know, people are going to say, ah, you must be new, right? Now, as a sell limit, you want your price or more. You know, so if I tell my broker to sell Apple at 160 and he says, Dean, uh, your limit went off, we got 161. I go, woohoo. So there's always an implied or better. So as a buyer, your price or less. As a seller, your price or more. And again, very testable to know where we place orders in relationship to the current market price. You'd be very foolish with Apple at 160 to tell me that you want to sell your Apple for 158 or better. I'd say, cool, you just sold it at 158 to moi, me, and then I'll sell at 160 and make two points. It would behoove you, test question, to place your sell limit above the current market price. It's very testable about where we place orders in relationship to the current market price, you know, and again, we're going to have a nice mnemonic to help us out in this regard that you have probably referenced. If not, if you're going to be doing a data dump sheet, for example, uh, maybe you want to add that to it. So that's going to be. So limits. Uh, and again, the whole point here is the customer is saying that price is more important than execution. Price is more important than execution. So with a market order, I'm more interested in execution. I want it and I want it now. With a limit order, uh, price is more important to me than execution. So there are the different orders for different, uh, different strokes for different folks, if you will. So here's some examples of uh, market orders. And you can see I made this slide uh, when Apple was trading at uh, about, uh, uh, well, we'll use this to talk about this. So Apple's trading app. One thing you wanna be able to do based on where we place orders in relationship to the current market price is to kind of be able to intuit where Apple's at. I'm using Apple, but you know, XYZ on the st uh, test or BFD. So a market order is pretty straightforward. I just tell my broker, buy me a thousand shares of Apple at the market. And again, here I want immediate execution, best available price. So now we're looking at a sell limit where a customer says sell a thousand shares of Apple at 130. So we should be able, we should be able to determine that Apple must be somewhere 
below 130. Apple is somewhere below 130. How does Dean know that Apple is somewhere below 130? Because I know that sell limits have to be placed above the current market price. So I know that in this situation, if it's a test scenario, that Apple is somewhere below 130. Again, this is another way of testing you about do you know where orders are placed in relationship to the current market price? Now, as we see here, as we see here, we have a buy thousand shares of Apple at 125. And I know that that buy limit is below that. So based on these two prices, I know that Apple must be trading between 130 and 125 because I know the sell limit is above the current market price and the buy limit is below. So this is another way of testing you on where the uh, market is in relationship to the order or orders that you're looking at on the exam, right? So we should know that the sell limit is above that price and the buy limit is below that price. And then remember, you're gonna be okay if I do better for you than that, right? Uh, as a buyer, you want your price or less. Is there another arrow in our quiver for a customer who wants to buy the stock at their price or less? So, you know, what we said right now, Apple is trading at uh, 160. Apple's trading at 160. And one thing you could do is you could put in a buy limit of Apple at 159. And, uh, you know, let's just talk about that. Nobody has to do business with you. That uh, buy limit may never get executed. You know, Apple goes up and you don't have the stock. Uh, or it might get executed at 159 or less and you do have the Apple. You know, you bought the Apple at less than the current market price. Current market price was 160. You put in a buy limit at 159 and you ended up buying the stock. Is there another way to do that? What is an alternative to a buy limit? An alternative to a buy limit order. I say, Cynthia, let me get this right. You would like to buy Apple at 159 and today Apple's at 160. She says, yes. I say, well, tell you what, Cynthia, why not get paid? Why not get paid to do something you say you're already prepared to do? You're telling me that you're prepared to buy Apple at 159 or less. And Cynthia, somebody will pay you several hundred dollars in advance to agree to buy Apple at 160, several hundred dollars. Hmm. Somebody will pay Cynthia several hundred dollars. You're on the right track, so you're not buy a put. What Cynthia would do is sell a put. Selling a put is an alternative to a limit order. So I say, Cynthia, why don't we sell an Apple 160 put uh, for four? If you uh, sell a 160 put on Apple for four, Cynthia, and you get executed, you'd be buying the stock at 160. If you get exercised, you got four, so you'd be paying 156. You'd be buying the stock at less than the current market price. She goes, woo. I go, now, hold on just a sec. 160 or higher, the put expires, you get to keep the $400. In the buy limit, you don't get nothing. Right? That buy limit doesn't go off. Cynthia doesn't get paid. She goes, well, Dean, uh, but what if I uh, buy the Apple at 160 and, uh, you know, the Apple's at 158? I go, wonderful, right? Because your break even is 156. And she goes, well, it goes to zero. I, will, I said, well, Cynthia, that would have been no different than if you put in a buy limit at 159 and went to zero. So, you know, if I'm a registered option principal, and I say, Caesar, why does uh, Cynthia want to be approved to sell puts? You know, one is she's a speculator and she's bullish and she just wants to keep the premium. But another good answer, she said, Dean, uh, Cynthia wants to uh, sell puts as alternatives to limit orders. There's our stocks that Cynthia is willing to buy, and she wants to get paid to do something she's already prepared to do. You know, uh, any option strategy that Mr. Buffett is a fan of is probably not a bad option strategy. You know, Mr. Buffett likes selling puts on stocks he's willing to buy. And then if he gets exercise, he says, oh, thank you very much. I wanted the stock anyways. I wanted the stock anyways. Now, the uh, disadvantage of that, right, is again, she's gonna have to be approved for options. Okay, stop orders are used to stop a loss 
That's the number one use, and that's why we call them stop loss orders. Why we call them stop loss orders. You know, part of successful investing, part of successful investing is letting your flowers bloom, but more important, pulling your weeds. And so, you know, I say, uh, uh, Cynthia, we uh, bought the Apple stock at 160. We bought the Apple stock at 160. How much are you uh, willing to lose approximately? At what point are we going to agree that this is a bad idea? She goes, I don't know, Dean. I'd be willing to lose approximately, you know, four points. I said, what I would suggest we do is place a sell stop, a sell stop to stop the loss. And I was uh, talking to this guy when I was a baby broker years ago and you know, I said, listen, uh, I'd like to open a new account with you. I'd like to buy a thousand shares at 50. If I'm right about the stock over the next 12 to 18 months, I think it could be a hundred dollar stock and we'd make $50,000. We'd double your money. But if I'm wrong about the stock, I could just easily be wrong and the stock could go to 20. So what I'd like to do with your permission is open the new account, buy a thousand shares at 50 and place a sell stop at 47. That way, you know, worst case is we're going to lose approximately $3,000 approximately $3,000. So, you know, what I'm trying to do here is stop a loss in a long stock position. Anyways, he was cracking up. He said, honey, there's a broker on the phone and says it's going to cost approximately uh, $3,000 to get to know him. I say approximately because if the order gets triggered, where's where we're heading, you know, it'll be uh, two separate events and then whatever that execution is. So sell stops can be used to stop a loss in a long stock position. And as I said, that's one of the main things that people use them for. You know, a lot of people have those uh, sell stops to stop that loss in a long stock position. Now, remember, we also have, we also have uh, short stock positions. And so if you're short a stock, I might say, listen, uh, at what point are we going to call it a day and put in a buy stop to stop a loss, stop the bleeding on a short uh, position. So a buy stop can be used. This is number one use. There's three uses, but this is number one to stop a loss in a short position. So, you know, it depends on what side of the market you're on, right? Because remember, in our business, we have long positions and we have uh, short positions. And the uses of the stops are very testable. Uh, but again, we've uh, been talking on the previous slide about uh, how you can use options as order equivalents, for example. So what's another way you can stop a loss in a stock position besides a sell stop? What is another way that you can stop a loss in a stock position besides using? Buy stop. Well, we're, we're gonna, be, no, not a buy stop. Buy a put, right? Another way to protect a stock position is by buying a put. Now, the disadvantage of buying the put is you gotta pay a premium, you gotta be approved for options and you can't move it around. You know, the advantage of the sell stop is you don't have to be approved for options, you don't have to place anything to, uh, Place it and you know you can move it around. All right, chance to redeem yourself. What's another way to stop a loss in a short stock position? Because again, don't be a dumb bear. Being a dumb bear is you short the stock and you don't take any risk mitigation strategies like placing a stop order. Uh, anybody know what we might want to consider? Sell a call. Buy a call. You want to have choices. Yes. That's okay. That's why we're doing it. Though. No, no big deal. But choices are protection. You know, you want to when you're when we're talking protection, you always want to have a choice, right? So when we talk protection, you're talking about paying a premium, paying a premium, right? Like an insurance policy. Okay. So let's say we're right. Let's say we're right. And the stock, if we're long, goes up. Or if we're short, the stock goes down and we have a profit. 
And so now what we might want to do is uh, move our stop down to protect that profit. Now we're going to go through some examples here in just a little bit, but that's another use of a stop is to protect a profit. So in my example, my customer, we got lucky. We bought the stock at 50. The stock went to 100. And I said, hey, listen, I'd like to move that sell stop up to uh, 97 to protect our profit, to protect our profit. And the third use is to establish a stock position, to establish a stock position. Now, uh, Erica says she just finished a final. And so I know that Erica is getting to become a better and better test taker. Each day she's getting to be a better test taker. And anytime there's three of a thing, like you see on this slide, what kind of format of question might you encounter on your test? Accept. They love that. They just love to give you those accept questions. And the reason they like them is because they get to test you on three things right? <laughs> and you only get one point. So I think a lot of people think, oh, it's 125 questions. Not really. It is. But I mean, you know, when you count the answer sets as being potential correct answers, uh, it becomes a little uh, bigger deal. All right. So, uh, you know, we have uh, people who practice, practice uh, technical analysis. We have people who practice technical analysis. And in technical analysis, we're going to have a support line and we're going to have a resistance line. Now we're talking about Apple. And if I'm a technical practitioner, you know, I don't believe in buying Apple when it's stuck in the station, when it's not going anywhere. You know, right now I told you Apple's at uh, 160. And so, you know, here's a chart on Apple. And, you know, and here is the, you know, the prices and we connect all the dots basically, but here is our chart on Apple. You know, it's in this trading range and nobody wants to buy the stock when it's in the trading range. You know, what I want to do is get on board the train when it leaves the station. So, you know, I'm watching this thing and a different color here. And when I want to buy the apples, when it breaks through, the resistance line. So again, very testable. What kind of order might a technical analyst place to establish a long stock position if it breaks through the resistance line? What are we going to place there? We're going to buy place stop. Right on. We're going to place a buy stop, maybe a 168. Now we don't have to on the test actually you know pick the thing it's going to be provided for us so we play a buy stop at 168 boom uh listen there's a lot of folks that have uh, buy stops above the current market price of apple you know some of those people have buy stops because they're uh, getting on board they're going long some of them are trying to protect a profit some are trying to stop a loss and so uh very testable to know that buy stops can accelerate a bullish trend. They'll say on the test, what type of order can accelerate a bullish trend? And you would say, accelerate a bullish trend. You would say a buy stop because it adds fuel to the fire, right? As the stock goes up, you know, these orders get triggered, causing more buyers, accelerating uh, that uh, uh, upward move. You know, I had a, a my cousin and he was making his wife nervous he was going to buy this stock and you know we were talking about it and you know i had punched up a chart while i was talking to him i said you know john you're making your wife nervous i mean she says that uh, you put your retirement plan online and you're playing video arcade games with the money and so she just asked me to give you a call and i said what's up and he said well dean the stock used to be a 40 dollars stock and now it's a 10 dollars stock and i said well john there's probably a reason for that and he said, well, Dean, I'm thinking about buying a thousand shares in my retirement plan at 10. And if it goes back to 40, I'm going to make $30,000. I said, that's a big if, John. I said, you know, if I were you, uh, I would do that in your personal account because if you're wrong, at least you can deduct up to $3,000 against your personal, you know, income tax, your ordinary income, your earned income. You know, the two major impediments, John, to investment success are taxation and inflation. And in your retirement account, you've already have beat taxation. So if we can beat inflation, we're getting ahead. And he said, well, Dean, it's none of your damn business, none of your damn business, 
but I don't ha have the money in my retirement plan. I go, well, that's probably not a good, uh, excuse me, in my personal account. I said, that's probably not a good reason to be day trading your, your uh, retirement plan. Anyways, I said, John, while we've been talking, I've uh, pulled up a chart. And it looks like this stock is kind of stuck in the station. It's not going anywhere. So, I mean, why would you want to tie up $10,000 on a train stuck in the station? I mean, you only want to get on the board, board the train when it goes, leaves the station going your way. So, you know, it's at 10 and it's kind of stuck there. Why don't you put in a buy stop at uh, 12? Tell your Schwab broker that if it trades at or through 12, you want to buy the stock. In the meantime, you still got your $10,000 earning interest. And, uh, you know, then if it goes, leaves the station and you get on board. Let's say it gets triggered at 12. We're going to be doing examples of this in a moment. I know you're excited. And uh, if maybe you get bad fill, 1250, goes to 40, you know, oh, well. I mean, so you make a little less than 30 grand, but you still got your money. He said, can I do that? I said, you certainly can. Now, a buy stop has to be placed above the current market price. And please note the stock is 10. I got a nice little beautiful memory aid device. We're going to be talking about this at length in just a little bit. But for right now, let's put this uh, right here. The buy stop is going above the market. Anyways, he did that. And after he did it, uh, the stock went 9865432, bankrupt. Uh, he never bought the stock. It left the station going the wrong way. You don't want to get on board that train. Right? He said, D man, that was so cool. You ever think about being a broker? I said, well, geez, John, I don't know what you think I did for 20 years, but you know. All right. So now we have buy stops that we're going to place above the resistance. But if we're technical practitioners, we don't really care whether we're going long or whether we're going short. What we care about is getting on board when the train leaves the station going our way. So what kind of order might a technical analyst place to establish a short position? We're looking at using a stop order right on. And where would we place that sell stop? Very testable, sell stops have to be placed uh, below the current market price, right? So we're gonna put our sell stop maybe at 152. Boom, and now I'm saying I wanna short the Apple, but only if it trades at or through 152. Uh, please note, lots of people have sell stops on Apple below the support line. So test question, what type of order might accelerate a bearish trend? A sell stop, right? Because as these sell stops get triggered, it adds more fuel to the fire. Right? So very testable. So those are all the various uses of uh, stop orders. All the various uses we have of stop orders. I would definitely uh, be prepared for the accept format as it relates to this. And uh, the sell stop, please note, has to be placed below the current market price. We'll be talking about that at length. I know you're excited. All right, so stop orders are suspended or contingent or uh, market orders. They can become a market order or a limit order. It's a, you know, it may or may never become a live order. I'm telling my broker, if this, then that. If it trades at or through 12, pull the trigger and buy the stock. If this, then that. If it trades, out or through 168, pull the trigger, make it a live market order. So we can uh, turn it into a market order or a limit order. I'm going to show you both. Now, as a test taker, you're going to be real careful on the test. Is this a stop order that's going to get triggered into a market order? One contingency, one qualifier. If this, then that. Or is it a stop order that if we pull the trigger, becomes a limit order? Because then we got to be a little more careful because now the customer is saying, if this, then I want my price or better. Now, Customers need to understand that the more contingencies or qualifiers they add to the order, the less likely that that order is going to get executed, right? So stop orders are suspended or contingent market or limit orders. They may never become live. That is a potential answer on your exam. You know, where we're going with this is we're going to be looking at a sequence of trades and determining whether or not the order ever became live. And then if it did, is it going to get executed or not? That's where we're heading. Stop orders don't become live market or limit orders until there's a trade at or through the trigger price. Two separate events. I can't tell you how many customers get confused about this. My customer is watching CNBC, watching the tape go by, and he calls me, goes, I saw my trade. I said, whoa, 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 whoa. You didn't see your trade. You said, well, Dean, my buy stop was at 12, and I saw a trade at 12. 
I go, that's not your trade. That is the trade that turns your suspended order, your contingent order into a live order. So very important as a test taker that you understand this is two separate events, two separate events. All right, so uh, sell stop orders, we're gonna we'll be looking at both sell stops and buy stops. We're gonna be looking at sell stops that get triggered into market orders. And we're gonna be looking at uh, sell stops that get triggered into limit orders. We're gonna then look at buy stops that get triggered into market orders or limit orders. We're gonna be looking at both. So sell stops, very testable are placed below the market. That's very testable. We have a nice memory of a device called slobs over bliss. I'll go over that at length with you towards the end of our time together. But again, here we go. Three of a thing. Sell stops can be used for all the following except. So sell stops are used to stop a loss in a long stock position, protect a profit in a long stock position, or establish a short stock position if the stock trades at or through the support line. Those are our three uses. So here's an example. This is very much a test scenario. So uh, sell stop order. A customer buys 1,000 shares of Apple at 128 and places a sell stop at 124. The following trades then occur. The following trades then occur. So now what we're going to do is we're going to go through these trades and see if anything happened here. Uh, please note, we did follow the convention. What I mean by following the convention is we have our sell stop and it's below the current market price. So we did indeed follow the convention. So anything happen at 127? Yes or no? Chat is open. Anything happen at 127? No. no. Anything happen at 126? No. Anything happen at 125? No. Anything happen at 124.05? No. 123.95, ding, 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 ding. There is no way on a number line to go from 124.05 to 123.95 without trading through 124. At or through, it now becomes a live order. Two separate events. Two separate events. P.S. It's now a live market order. It is a live market order. So it doesn't matter what the next trade is. Whatever the next trade is, it's my customer's order. It doesn't matter if that's 123. It doesn't matter if that's 125 because this is a sell stop at 124. It's not a sell stop limit. I'm going to show you that. This is not a sell stop limit. This is just a straight sell stop. It turns into a market order, two separate events. Now these on the test would be labeled and you would have to tell me that on trade five is when this order became live. Now, remember, it may not become live, but that's where it comes live. And then you would have to tell me whatever that number is where we receive execution. So any question on that sequence before we look at another one? All right, let's look at another one. Uh, here's another example of a sell stop. We're looking at sell stops. A customer buys 1,000 shares of Apple at 128. Apple is now trading at 187. Woohoo! We might want to consider protecting our profit. That sounds like a reasonable thing to be able to do. We place a sell stop at 185. Please note, we followed the convention. And so we're, what I mean by the convention is we placed it in the appropriate place in relationship to the current market price. Anything happen at 186? No. Anything happen at 187? No. 185.05? No. No. 185.01? No. No, nothing happens at 185.01. No. 185. This time it traded at, at or through two separate events. This is now a live market order. It's been triggered or elected. Pull the trigger. I told my broker, if this, then that. I told my broker, pull the trigger. The order has been elected. Those are contingent events. They may or may not happen, but the order has been triggered. And remember here when we're pulling the trigger or here when it's elected, it becomes a market order. And so you would tell me that whatever that next trade is, that's my customer's trade. Uh, what else could we have used besides a sell stop to protect this profit? What other arrow in our quiver might we have used to protect this profit?
protect, protect. Whenever you hear the word protect, it's not so. I'm being, by the way, I'm being facetious. Right, there you go. If you want protection, you gotta buy, right? So another thing you might wanna consider is buying a put. You might wanna consider buying a put. You know, there's, you know, you can accomplish different things with orders versus, you know, options. So we could buy a, buy a, like an Apple 185 put maybe. That's right. I, I would say sell for income is usually I would say that. But, you know, as long as you can pick it out of the lineup, so to speak. Okay, so let's uh, try another one. Let's try another one there. We did that one. Uh, sell stop order. Here's another one. I think it was, I don't know if it was you, Cynthia. But uh, I think that we did one of these evening classes and people said they want to do some more questions like this. I think that was you. So this is, uh, I've added some more questions to these uh, evening uh, things. Anyway, so here's, here's a practice question. A uh, technical analyst is looking at a chart of the trading history of Apple. The chart shows Apple to have resistance at 130 and support at 120. Uh, which order might a technical analyst place below the support level? No, and again, the support level is 120. 118. Yeah, so it would be C. Would you agree the answer is C? Now, you wouldn't want to do the limit. You can do that even if you wanted to, but you remember the limit order. We're going to look at that. If you pull the trigger and now it's a limit order, you may or may not get on board the train, right? Because now you're saying you want your price or better, and you know, you know, nobody has an obligation to do that with you. And so the answer to this is a C. Uh, I think that's a good practice question obviously, because I'm the guy who wrote it. So, you know, a uh, technical analyst, did we just do that one or is it different? Oh, look at this, man. I beefed these things up, didn't I? A uh, technical analyst is looking at a chart of the trading history of Apple. The chart shows Apple to have resistance at 130 and support at 120. Uh, which order might accelerate a bearish trend? So the first thing to think about is, well, bearish trends are caused by having more sellers than buyers. And bullish trends are caused by more buyers than sellers. And so, yes, once again, it's the sell stop at 118, right? The sell stop C, indeed, it is C. Let me uh, just put that there because, you know, people will be watching this on replay. All right, so pretty good. Now we have buy stop orders and buy stop orders are placed above the current market price. That's very testable. We have a nice memory aid device for that. And uh, we're gonna use buy stops to stop a loss in a short stock position, protect a profit in a short stock position or establish a long stock position if it trades through the resistance line. Again, anytime there's three of a thing, the accept format, right? So we said we use these to stop losses, protect profits and establish stock positions, but we have two versions of them, right? We have the version of a sell stop and then we have buy stop. So let's look at this uh, scenario now. So same thing, a customer, same thing, but on the other side of the market, right? A customer sells short a thousand shares of Apple, 128. So he's afraid that it's gonna go up and he places a buy stop at 132. So he's trying to stop the loss. What else might he have used as a mitigation strategy if he's afraid about a loss in the short stock position? What other risk mitigation strategy might he use? Excellent, excellent, Caesar. This time you got it right. <laughs> right? Like, I'm teasing Caesar, but that comes part of the process is uh, practice drilling, rehearsing, and missing questions. So it's counterintuitive, and missing lots of questions is good. You know, Erica just told me she finished a final, and she said, "Man, I missed a lot of questions." I go, "That's great. Let's see if we can miss some more tomorrow," because you know that's part of the process is missing lots of questions, right? So. Uh, good job. Good job. All right. So, uh, whoops, is that what we're doing? Where are we at? My bad. Okay. So let's do this one. Uh, whoop, we did that one. Whoop, I'm going the wrong direction. Sorry about that. There we go. Okay. So now same deal. Uh, please note we follow uh, the convention. Uh, what I mean by following the convention is we placed our buy stop above the current market price. And again, this is test phraseology. A customer sells short a thousand shares of Apple at 128 and places a buy stop at 132, the following trades then occur, right? So we're watching the trades go by, we're watching the tape on CNBC. Does anything happen at 129? Anything happen at 129? No. Anything happen at 130? No. no. Anything happen at 131? No. Anything happen at 132.01? No. Yes. 
Ding, ding, ding. No, no, it has to trade at or through 132.01. Oh, excuse me. My bad. My bad. You're correct. Buy stop at 132. Uh, that is uh, not bueno. Dean, uh, the instructor has missed a question, right? So let's clean up that slide. Erase the evidence, <laughs> right? So here it didn't trade at. See, trade may at. I? What's that? May I? I'm sorry. May I? I can't understand what you're saying. What? Try it one more time. Your the audio is not coming in very well. I said, may I? May I? May you what? Eh. <laughs> there you go. Of course. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Fair game, right? <laughs> of course. <laughs> yeah. I'm in, I deserve it just in deserving an eh than anybody else. Now, again, we want to be careful here because now it's a live order. Now I've given you the next trade. So remember, this would be labeled on the test, right? And now you have to tell me two things. You have to tell me that on the test, this became a live order on trade four. And here, boom, is execution. Because again, we're turning these into market orders. We haven't turned them into limit orders. And limit orders is going to be a little trickier. What I mean by that is if we turn this into a limit order, we've got to be a little more careful about what this trade is because it may or may not be acceptable to my customer. But if it's actually we're pulling the trigger, if this, then that, and we're pulling the trigger, it becomes a market order. When poof, we're out of here. We're out of here, right? So excellent, excellent. Catch, catch the instructor. I love it. Okay, so let's try another one. A customer sells short a thousand shares of Apple at one twenty-eight. Several weeks later, Apple's trading at ninety-five. So, are we happy or are we sad if we sold short Apple at one twenty-eight and now it's at ninety-five? Are we happy or are we sad? Happy or sad? Happy. Yeah, we're happy, right? Because we're, you know, we want to sell high and buy low. So everything's going according to plan here. And so what we might want to do is use a buy stop test question to protect our profit. And then again, the following trades then occur. So please note, we did indeed follow the convention. We put our buy stop above the current market price. And again, chance for Dean to, re Dean to redeem himself now, right? Let's see if I can avoid the ain't. <laughs> so well, these would be labeled, you know, trade one, two, three, four, five. And by the way, this sequence may go out quite a ways, right? In terms of the sequence of trades they're showing us. So anything happen at uh, 96? No. 97? No. 97, 95? No. Uh, let's see. I don't think you're going to get me this time. Add or through. It becomes a live market order. And now you tell me execution at 99, right? So either at or through. So I've shown you both versions here, at or through. Sometimes I get a little aggravated with test prep vendors because a lot of times they continually show you the same thing. They either show you like always at or always through. They don't show you different uh, permutations of this thing in terms of being at or through. So uh, I like to show you a little bit of both. And uh, Cynthia said, Dean, how about you? We do some questions in these evenings together. I said, okay, you got it. A, a technical analyst is looking at a chart of the trading history of Apple. The chart shows Apple to have resistance at 130 and support at 120. What order might a technical analyst place above the resistance line? What type of order might they place above the resistance line? A. Yeah, right on, right on. And remember, there's a lot of people that do that. A lot of folks that are placing buy stops to either stop losses or protect profits or establish stock positions. Whoop. Uh, a technical analyst. Uh, whoop. I'm sorry, Mike. There we go. A, a technical analyst is looking at a chart of the trading history of Apple. The chart shows Apple to have resistance at 130 and support at 120. What order might accelerate a bullish trend? What order might accelerate a bullish trend? Yeah, it's A again, right? It's A. So this is the actually the same question, just asking you to answer in a different way uh, based on a different answer set. And as I just said, that's because a lot of people have these things above the market. As they get triggered, that adds more fuel to the fire, more fuel to the fire, so to speak. All right, now this is very foolish. You can do this if you want to. You know, so now the customer is saying, Dean, when we pull the trigger, I don't want it to become a market order. I say, oh, man, this is uh, not smart, not bueno. You know, 
And he says, why? I say, because now you're adding a second qualifier. You know, the more qualifiers or contingencies you add to the order, the more or less likely it is that you're going to get execution. So stop limits become live limit orders instead of market orders. So now we're going to be a little more careful. Again, now when we pull the trigger, if we if and when, because we may not remember saying if this, then that, if there's no this, there'll be no that. It's going to become not a live market order, but a live limit order. So now we got to be a little careful. Now, off the bat, whether you want a sell stop that turns into a market order or a sell stop that turns into a limit order, all sell stops have to be placed below the current market price. So if it's a sell stop that becomes a market order or a sell stop that becomes a limit order, it's placed below the market. Right. So again, test takers get hung up all the time. I thought sell limits are above the market. They are. Sell limits are above the market. This is not a sell limit. It's a sell stop limit. And the sell stop means it goes below. So a customer buys 1,000 shares of Apple at 128 and places a sell stop limit at 124. Now, if I'm your broker, I'm going to say this is so foolish because now you're telling me that you only want to go home if you can get 124 or better or more. And that means you may not be able to get out of the stock because there might not be a trade at 124 or better. So then we get this sequence of trades again. Anything happen at 127? No, we're looking for two things now. We're looking for a trade at or through 124 and then a price that is acceptable, which would be 124 or more. Anything happen at 126? No. 125? No. 124.05? No. Ding, 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 ding. Now it's become a live limit order. And so this next trade may or may not be acceptable. If this trade is uh, 123, he will not accept it. If the trade is 123.99, he won't accept it. You know, if the stock is 120, if the next trade is 125, he'll accept it. So that is the danger of this sell stop limit. As I said, you got to be real careful on this as a test taker, because now that matters what that next price is in the sequence. And remember, the sequence can carry through. It could be a longer sequence than this, perhaps. Uh, any questions on this one? Again, kind of foolish. You're kind of foolish here, because what you're saying is you want to pull the trigger and go home, but only if you can get your price or better. Right? So let's do another one. A uh, customer buys... 1,000 shares of Apple, 128 uh, per share. You know, you know I, I'm being prejudicial, I know, but I used to have customers like this and they just drive me nuts because now he's getting even, even more tricky, right? He's saying, Dean, I want to pull the trigger at 124, but I want my limit at a different price. Can I do that? I go, absolutely, you can do that. I think it's foolish, but you know, hey, are we clear on what he's saying now? Now he's saying that if we pull the trigger, then he wants to sell, but he wants to do so at 123. So he's got a trigger price that is different than his limit price. So again, a little trickier still, right? The following trades that occur, please note, we did follow the convention. So whether you want a sell stop that turns into a market order or a sell stop that turns into a limit order, it uh, gets placed below the market. Following trades that occur, nothing happens here. We're looking for trade at or through, and then we're looking for something that's better than that. Is a seller his price or more? So nothing happens there. Nothing happens there. Nothing happens there. Ding, 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 ding. Now it's a live limit order at 123. So again, if that next price is 123 or higher, it is acceptable. If that next trade is 122, 121, 120, he doesn't accept it. All right. So kind of foolish here to add it at different prices. So you can turn your stop order into a market order or you can turn it into a market order. So here's an example of a buy stop on it. So we looked at sell stops that turned into market orders, and then we turned, looked at sell stops that turned into limit orders. And now we're doing the same. We looked at buy stops that turned into market orders, and now we're looking at buy stop that turned into limit orders. Doesn't matter whether you want a buy stop that turns into a market order or a buy stop that turns into a limit order, buy stops are above the market price. And please note, we follow the convention here. A customer sells short 1,000 shares of Apple at 128. Several weeks later, the Apple's at, at 95, so we're looking good. 
and he places a buy stop limit. So now he's saying, Dean, if it trades at or through 98, I want to uh, buy it, but only if I can do so for 98 or less. There's always an implied or better. And again, I think this is foolish now because again, we have to be careful. We got two qualifiers, two contingency. And our buy stops and sell stops that turned into market orders trigger, poof, execution. Trigger, poof, execution. In these limits, it's uh, trigger and then my price are better. So that's a little different. So nothing happens here. Nothing happens here. We're looking for a trade at or through 98. Ding, 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 ding. Well, no. We remember it's above the market. So ding, 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 ding. Would this trade be acceptable? So here it became live because it traded at 98. Is 99 an acceptable trade? Would that customer accept that trade? No, he's still in the short stock position because he wants 98 or less. And so, you know, if this thing goes to 100 or 101 or 102, he's not out of the position. If the next trade was 98, he would accept it. So again, a little trickier on these ones, a little trickier. Hey, Dean, a yeah. quick question for you. Uh -huh. So when would it be appropriate to put in a limit? Well, remember on the test, you don't need to tell me it's appropriate or not. I'm just sharing my prejudicial behavior with you. But on the test, what you have to do is actually practical application. Uh, I, you know, I was talking to somebody today and I said, I could never decide how much leadership to show. So, you know, I was talking like, you know, uh, I know some people who do what I do that don't go over questions that they think are not productive. They just tell them I'm not going to go over the question. And I, you know, was telling the person, I do go over the question, even though I know it's not something that I, I would like to do. And, you know, you know, and if they're spending their money, I kind of feel bad taking their money on something I don't think they're going to count on the exam. But anyways, I'm just saying that in leadership, it's the same as a broker, right? They tell the customer whether or not, now you have to test the question, you have to follow your customer's instructions. So if this is what the customer wants to do, we got to follow up. But, you know, at some point, you know, maybe as a broker, when you're, it's hard to do this when you're a baby broker, but if you're an established broker, I told you, I had a doctor client used to drive me nuts. And finally, you know, I had to fire him as a client and just say, listen, this is ridiculous. You know, this is, this isn't working for you and it isn't working for me. And to be honest with you, that's what he used to do. He'd give me like, for example, a buy stop limit at the close, all or none. My God, that order has like four contingencies. And, and then he called me and said, go off. And I go, well, what do you think? I didn't say that, but you know, all this, and by the way, God forbid the stars lined up and it did go off because you say, see, Dean, sometimes, <laughs> so, but I, I, everybody's different. You know, uh, some people are more frugal. You know, I had a millionaire, millionaire guy who used to drive me nuts because I would just want to park the car and pay the valet. I said to me, this is a wonderful deal. We hand him 20 bucks. The car disappears. We had him another 20 bucks. The car reappears. I mean, do we really want to spend 20 minutes for driving around trying to find a parking spot? I don't. You know, so everybody's a little different. Uh, this is very much a memory aid device that's worth a lot of points. And uh, have you seen this memory aid device before? This is a remind us where we place orders in relationship to the current market price. So slobs over bliss. Now, you know, some people like to do data dump sheets, you know, and if I were doing a data dump sheet, you know, if I told you you could have one piece of paper with anything on it, front and back, what would be on it. I would have my matrix for sure. I'd probably have this for sure. The O is just to make this a memory aid device and mnemonic. So the slobs, sell limits and buy stops. And remember we said, whether you want a buy stop that turns into a market order or a buy stop that turns a limit order, it goes above, above the market. And then buy limits and sell stops. And remember where it's a sell stop that turns into a market order or a sell stop that turns into a limit order, it goes below the market. Now, the other thing you want to know below the market is we're going to reduce the orders below the markets for uh, cash dividends. And the reason we're going to do that is because you wouldn't want your order to be triggered as a result of the adjustment from the cash dividend. So that too would be testable to know that the orders that are going to get adjusted are going to be the orders below the market. So I'm kind of lazy. So I would just know the orders below the market. And then I would know if it's not bliss, then it must be on the other side. Now, if you don't want us to adjust your orders, if you don't want us to adjust your orders, you could tell us DNR. And that means do not reduce my orders. Just leave them the way I have placed them. And that's up to the customer who wants to do that. Taking discretion, very testable. So what constitutes, we're talking about types of orders, and here we're talking about what is a discretionary order. A discretionary order is when I'm going to make a decision about action asset amount. If I'm making a decision about action, asset, or amount, I need to have discretionary authority on that uh, account. 
And I have to have that discretionary authority in place before we do the first discretionary trade. You know, and on your confirm, it will tell you discretion exercised or discretion not exercised, whatever the case may be. And so uh, let's try one. Uh, is this a discretionary order? Caesar does not have discretionary authority on my account. Caesar does not have discretionary authority on my account. I say, Caesar, buy 10,000 shares of Apple today at whatever time and price you think looks good. Buy 10,000 shares of Apple today at whatever time and price you think looks good. Is that an acceptable order if Caesar does not have discretionary authority? You're right, it is, right? Because the three A's are present. Let's try another one. Caesar does not have discretionary authority on my account. I say, Caesar, there's a, a jumbo CD of 100 grand coming due. Buy me whatever utility stocks you think look good. Buy me whatever utility stocks you think look, look good. Buy me 100,000. Is that acceptable or not acceptable? That's not acceptable, right? Because he doesn't have discretionary authority. Let's try another one. Uh, Caesar, I'm gonna be in the Philippines in Mindanao with my missionary father and I may not make it back alive. You know, one of the leading industries in Mindanao is kidnapping you know, Christian missionaries and their sons, I'm joking. I'm not a missionary, well, I'm not really joking, but I'm joking about it. <laughs> Anyways, I say, Caesar, there's 10,000 shares of GE in my account. If it looks like it's going to drop dramatically, sell it. There's 10,000 shares of GE in my account. If it looks like it's going to drop dramatically, sell it. Yeah, you know, you may be foolish to take that order, but it's acceptable, right? Because the three A's are present. So, you know, a very kind of a testable scenario for you. We don't need discretionary authority for time and price. Uh, again, here's some examples of a test question. So what we want to do is we're looking for the three A's. If the three A's are present, it's now meta, but you know, it was Facebook. Um, it's not a discretionary order. So let's see. So sell, we're looking for the three A's. There's our action. There's our amount, 500 shares. There's our asset. The three A's are present. And so that is not a discretionary order, right? All right, let's look at our next one. There's our action. There's our asset. There's our amount. The three A's are present. There's our action. There's our amount. There's our asset. The three A's are present. There's our action. There's our amount. Uh-oh. That is the discretionary order. Market not held. Market not held. Now, depending on who your floor broker is, depends on whether this is a good idea or not. And what I'm telling my floor broker, the floor broker is the uh, person who executes orders for clients and member firms. So if I tell you I'm the floor broker for Merrill Lynch or Morgan Stanley or UBS or Merrill, Merrill Lynch, I'm the guy who's executing orders for clients of the firm. And so here I tell my, uh, my floor broker, maybe I'm a Morgan Stanley customer. I tell my floor broker, buy 5,000 baby Berkshire Hathaway market not held. Market on held means don't tell anybody in the auction that you're holding my order. Very testable. The New York Stock Exchange can be characterized as an auction order driven market. What they're doing is they're matching buyers and sellers. And so I'm telling them to go into the crowd, the auction, but don't tell anybody he has my order and do it at whatever time and price he thinks looks good. First test question. Does this order require discretionary authority? Buy, there's the action. There's the amount. There's the asset. Does a market not held order require discretionary authority? Yes or no? It does not. No. It does not, right? Because the three A's are present. So this does not require discretionary authority. Second test question, please note who has it. It's the floor broker. You know, on the New York Stock Exchange, you do sometimes get tested on participants and one participant is the designated market maker, the specialist. That is not the person holding this order. The person holding this order is the floor broker. You know, the, the specialist, the designated market maker would be holding the limit orders and the stop orders, but not this order. That's our second test uh, implication. 
So uh, the limit orders are held on the book of the designated market maker or the specialist. So we're talking about the New York Stock Exchange here. We're not talking about NASDAQ. NASDAQ is much different in terms of how things work. And so you say, Dean, what's going on in the auction right now for the uh, baby Berkshire shares? You know, by the way, it doesn't matter. This is Berkshire B. It doesn't matter. You know, there's two types of Berkshire. There's Berkshire A and there's Berkshire B, right? The, these are called the baby Berkshires. I say right now in the auction, uh, the uh, quote, the quote is not from market makers. The quote is 238.91 uh, on the bid and 238.99 on the ask. Five by two, there's 500 shares available at 238.91 and 200 shares available at 238.99. I say, are you a buyer or a seller? Because remember, you give me a market order, it's going to be immediate execution, the best available price. And so you say, Dean, I'm buying 200 shares at the market. So you're going to buy 200 shares at the market. We're going to match you with a seller. And I would say you bought 200 shares at 238.99. When a customer is looking at two prices, the customer always pays the high price and always receives the low price. So that's our first point. But you might be pleasantly surprised. You know, listen, ladies and gentlemen, in over-the-counter trading, you're never going to be pleasantly surprised. All of the surprises are going to be unpleasant. But if the uh, designated market maker wanted to right now, he could fill you at 238.98. Wow. That's called price improvement. You'd be pleasantly surprised. Now, whoever this limit order is, this is a limit order. This is a sell limit from a customer of a member firm. If they bitch, what's the specialist going to say? He's going to say, I was willing to sell it at a lower price than you. So right now, the specialist is allowed to buy the stock into his own account for anything better than the limit orders that he's holding. Now, and as I said, that's called price improvement. So right now, the specialist could uh, buy this at $238.92. And the person who's sitting there with that buy limit at 91 complains. The specialist says, hey, I was willing to do it at a price better than you. And right now he could sell this out of his account for anything less than that price. So the specialist is allowed to buy, but he has to do so within the thing. Now, by the way, that benefits the customers using market orders because it narrows the spread. It narrows the spread. All right, so let's look at uh, some additional qualifiers or contingencies. Now, remember the biggest thing about quali uh, qualifiers or contingencies is the more contingencies or qualifiers you add, the less likely it is the order is gonna get executed. So again, we're looking at the auction market, Berkshire Hathaway, uh, baby, the bees. And right now the auction, it's 238.91, 238.99, five by two. And so if you're a buyer, I'm gonna match you with a seller. Right, these are the limit orders. What determines the quote on the New York Stock Exchange test question are orders. It's an auction order driven market. By the way, it's a double auction, meaning there's both buyers and sellers in the auction place. And so you tell me that you want to buy 300 shares, fill or kill. And I said, well, I'm sorry, Caesar. There's only But unlike fill or kill, he expect a partial execution. We lost Caesar. Uh, I'm sorry, we lost him. Are you not there anymore, Caesar? That's okay. I'll, I'll change. It's Diego. <laughs> you know? Or did I lose you intellectually? Maybe that's what you mean. So let's, uh, I told you I'm kind of demented. So I use these terms outside of our industry. Uh, maybe that will be helpful for you, but you know, when I'm chaperoning the boys' uh, high school basketball team years ago, oh, Zoom is lagging, so I'm lagging. I'm having an internet connection problem? Oh, I hope not. Anyways, I say I pull up with the boys' basketball team. I say 15 max, 15 fries, 15 shakes, fill or kill. That means I want this order now or kill it. I'm out of here. Off to Burger King we go. If I say 15 max, 15 fries, 15 shakes, meter cancel, they say, Dean, here's seven fries, three shakes, and two max. I'll accept partial execution. All or none, 15 max, 15 fries, 15 shakes. I'll pull my bus in the back. 
when you get the order together, I want one fill. I don't want you piecing this out to me. You know, I had a customer once who put in an order to buy a hundred contracts and I got a report. His name is John that I got 20 contracts. I said, John, I don't want to have these contracts being doled out to us on the remaining 80 contracts. Can I make it fill or kill? And he said, well, Dean, that's pretty aggressive. Is there any other qualifier? I go, oh my goodness, here we go again with customers who want to use all these qualifiers. I said, we can make it a meet or a cancel. That would mean we get another 50 contracts and we cancel the rest. Or we can make it all or none on the 80. We'll wait, but we want it all in one fill. So here in the example I gave you, if Caesar gave me 300 immediate or cancel, he'll get the 200 because there's 200 available at that price. Now we're going to match him with the seller. And then all or none, he says, Dean, what's going on? I said, well, nothing because, you know, there's only 200 chairs there. So again, there's going to be no partial execution and all or none. I want it all, but I'm willing to wait. Well, that sometimes happens, unfortunately. All right. Well, we did a pretty good, Cynthia. We were a little over an hour again, but we did add some questions. Are there any other questions uh, from this evening uh, class? The next one is going to be debt securities. Uh, and uh, I think that's on the schedule for whatever that's on the schedule for. And then remember, you also get your uh, live stream overtime. There's still a couple of spots for that next Tuesday. And I need to add another office hour free office hour. I think there's one coming up at uh, full, but I'll add another one when they're full. Any questions or comments? Are you guys still there? Did we lose everybody? I hope not. No, Dean, I have questions, but not related to this. Well, that's okay. So let's just uh, say class is officially over. And if you have any other questions you want to ask before we uh, hit the end button, I'm okay with that, Cynthia. So what do you got? Is that Cynthia? Oh, Erica. No. Erica. What do you got, Erica? Um, I, I just, I, I have a feeling my, um, test window or are you still recording Dean? I am. You want me to stop the recording? Let's stop the recording. Two, 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 two. Hold on. I got to figure out how to do that.